Thanks, look, thanks for including me in this. It was really interesting to listen in. Um, perhaps I'll, I guess the, the, the starting point is that, uh, you know, looking at the Commission on Sustainable Agriculture and Climate Change, it, it really brought together a, a clear storyline, which, which, as a practitioner in this area, I really appreciate. And that, that wasn't an easy task, um, because things have been changing and moving so quickly. Uh, in this in this debate about what's the interface between climate change and agriculture more generally and environmental issues uh, even more generally. To really crudely characterize my sense of where things have been shifting is that we've had a very helpful shift in, in that debate from perhaps a few years ago the climate change issue being seen as largely a carbon markets issue that revolved around uh, you know how can issue, how can uh, agriculture or how can carbon markets be brought into agriculture through a, a sort of debate within the UNFCCC, which is quite a narrow, specific thing, uh, to a much, uh, to really placing climate change as something that really transforms the context for everything that we do in this, in this area. Um, this we've set out quite, uh, hopefully also clearly in IFAD's new climate change strategy and our environment and natural resource management policy. I mean, I'm often asked by our country program managers, you know, is this whole climate thing sort of old wine in new bottles? What's really different about this? Because we've been doing drought management, drought tolerance, um, rural development for years. Um, and I think that's the right question to ask, actually. I think there's a lot of demystifying that needs to be done around this whole issue. And that's what I think the Commission helped us do in providing this narrative. What I tend to say in response, by the way, is that climate change is really transforming the risk profile for all our work. So we can't just use historical drought frequencies. We can't use the familiar risks that we were comfortable with. We need to think about new risks like sea level rise is already having a major impact in many of the places we're working. Um, we need to look at longer run risks. Um, and really, uh, you know, how we, how we make, uh, help communities manage when there's so much uncertainty about what climate change is going to do to that community. That's why we're often now talking about building adaptive capacity as opposed to a specific investment based on certainty about what's going to happen in that area. So a lot more risk management, um, and secondly, a kind of huge scale up in, in the successful sustainable agriculture practices that have been piloted around the world for years. Uh, we think those are really ready for scale up, and that's not just scale up of a bunch of technical interventions. It's also change in a way of thinking actually about agriculture, um, which again the Commission set out, uh, and that's really systems thinking. It's not thinking around specific crops or specific uh, projects. It's thinking about landscapes, ecosystems. Uh, because if you have narrow systems thinking, your response to climate change will be wrong. You'll be just simply looking at how do we produce rice in a more, for example, saline tolerant way without looking at whether rice is the best crop, for example. It's possibly leading to maladaptation. And the third is that we need to very much change the way we measure what we do, not just looking at traditional indicators of food production, even what are often short-term uh, poverty reduction in project areas, but having a much wider frame, looking at things like the emission impacts, looking at things like uh, impacts on biodiversity, on climate resilience, where the indicators are, are very are not yet developed about how you would measure the resilience of communities. We're working hard on that. So, you know, one, one initiative I wanted to share in, in building on that was uh, something that IFAD has been developing with a number of donors over the last uh, year or so, which is uh, uh, trying to create a way for fast-track climate finance to be used to stimulate this big scale-up of sustainable agriculture based on the sense we have that a lot of that finance is not getting to the smallest smallholder communities, and its smallholder is sort of the focus for IFAD in our lending and, and grant programs. So uh, we've developed this initiative called the Adaptation for Smallholder Agriculture Program, ASAP, 
and it really tries to take climate finance and use it uh, in a grant form to uh, stimulate, um, to provide in a sense a shock stimulus through, through our programs to increase the, the, the amount of the overall IFAD portfolio that's spent on climate resilience. And we, we, we commit about $1 billion a year into smallholder agriculture. And if we can get a, a significant share of that to be much more explicitly focused on building climate resilience through things like better landscape management, we think that will be a good thing and will be a good example of the kind of partnerships that are needed. And this is where GDPRD really needs to help us because our sense is that we've got much of the technical knowledge, not all of it, that's needed to confront climate change, or at least the kind of climate change we're going to experience for the next 10, 20, 30 years. Our main challenge is actually mindset. And to respond, to be able to change mindsets requires an enormous collective effort around knowledge management and advocacy work. And that's where any one organization acting alone simply won't be successful. And that's where partnerships like ASAT, which is a partnership, for example, between a, an agriculture-focused um, uh, development organization with donors, is, is the kind of thing that we need to kind of be creative and look at ways to bring together, for example, finance and institutions with smallholders. So I really hope to see GDPRD doing a lot more of this kind of work. And, you know, it's important for us to recognize that this work, yes, needs to try and build awareness of smallholders and agriculture more generally in the UNFCCC and the, and the environment context such as Rio. And we're working hard on that but not take our eye off the main challenge, which is to reform our houses from within. It's the agriculture community that really uh, still has some way to go in embracing climate change and understanding what it means for us in the context of our wider agronomic and uh, understanding of, of agriculture. And that's where um, there's an awful lot we can still do working together to have an impact on that. Thank you. Thank you. That was very brief. Okay. <laughs> um, you said so many interesting things. Uh, I think that, that perhaps I would ask you, take my privilege as moderator here, to develop a couple of things here that you said. Uh, one, you said that um, IFAD is using climate finance as a shock stimulus. What do you mean by shock stimulus? Sounds uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, well, it depends uh, yeah, from what perspective you see it. The, um, what, what we hope to do, so I need to turn the volume down, getting feedback here. Um, what we're trying to do is to absorb as an extra, in a sense, window in our core replenishment of IFAD, which is a three year cycle. We've created this extra window called ASAP, where donors with earmarked climate or environment finance can make a contribution to our core programs um, in a way that we wouldn't otherwise be able to receive. In a sense, we've created an extra way to absorb that finance. And what we will then do is manage, in a sense, uh, a competitive process internally such that a, a large share or a share of IFAD's new investments will receive an additional grant uh, which is extremely attractive to partner governments and to our country programs. But that will come with, um, in a sense, some expectation that the, the, the investment which we will be co-financing, and of course the grant itself, will enable climate resilience to be really fundamentally addressed through that program. So we'll be, in a sense, using this finance to incentivize what we aim for will be a doubling of the share of IFAD's new lending um, on um, environments and natural resource management activities, for example. So in a sense, it's an internal incentive. Which, and that's where actually grant finance can be an extremely powerful incentive in development finance organizations, because some of our finance is provided in the form of, of extremely concessional lending. Um, and there is some reluctance by governments, which I understand completely, 
to, in a sense, pay for the extra cost of climate resilient investments um, through any kind of lending operation, even if it's highly concessional. And that's where the grant finance can unlock doing a whole bunch of, of different and new things in, um, in, a, in a larger investment operation. Okay, so the, it's the doubling that's the shock, not the <laughs> anything yeah. else. Very good. Uh, questions from the floor? Here. Comments? Questions from our cyberspace? If not, I have another. Oh, well, here we do. Sorry, Hannah. Hi. Hi, my name is Hannah Wettestan. I'm working for the Swedish Cooperative Center and uh, uh, an organization called the VI Agroforestry Program, working around Lake Victoria with agroforestry mainly. And uh, we have developed a specific uh, project that is uh, measuring the amount of carbon that could be stored in the soil through agroforestry or sustainable agricultural land use management practices. Uh, and uh, so uh, we have uh, done this in order to try to see whether there is more funding to be uh, found within the, the climate funds, so to say. Uh, and so, and you, you just started by saying that this report actually opens up the whole involvement of agriculture in, in climate change, in the climate change debate. And so my question to you is, uh, or if you could just uh, say in general what, what kind of potential you think that carbon finance or the role of carbon finance in, in uh, how, do you, how can you say, finding an agriculture that is more resilient to, to climate change in general, especially for small-scale farmers. Okay, um, thanks for that question. Um, I, my, own, my sense is that the whole question of carbon finance and climate smart agriculture or even agriculture and rural development more generally needs to be handled with extreme caution. On the one hand, we need to try and find ways that through which smallholder farmers who are already um, acting as ecosystem managers and can do better, therefore have an important impact on emissions, should be rewarded for those impacts. But we need to be extremely careful that what currently look like quite small income streams um, don't distort the whole debate. Um, don't lead to a sense that smallholder farmers and agriculture more generally should only do the kind of things that are necessary to reform agriculture, sustainable agriculture, simply for the reasons of accessing carbon finance. It somehow communicates that this isn't good for us anywhere. Whereas in reality, most of the projects I've seen where we've been trying to access carbon finance from largely the voluntary markets, it's such a small income stream. It's really only the icing on the cake. And it's not what determines the decision about that particular investment. It's something that helps. And sometimes, actually, the rules are such, I have been hearing, that um, it sort of limits the flexibility of the, the smallholder farmers to evolve and change, uh, for example, their use of agroforestry techniques over time. So, I mean, we see it as an important long-run objective to have smallholders access these. So long as it's done equitably, it's done where their tenure arrangements are clear, and so long as it doesn't distort the debate. For us, actually, the main debate around all of this is not centered around the UNFCCC or carbon finance. It's really centered around what is the best agricultural and food system uh, and what's in our interest. And what we've seen is that most of the practices which lead to reduced emissions um, tend actually to be in the interests of smallholder farmers anyway. There are some examples where they're not, especially if we single-mindedly focus on emissions, which we would never intend to do. So it's what some describe as a multiple benefit. But for us, it would not be the entry point in our engagement with those communities. It's a wonderful co-benefit 
and it's a co-benefit that we should measure so that when we explain the benefits of development finance to donors and governments and the role of smallholders, we can say here's the impact we have, but it won't be the thing that actually determines what we do. It's a, by lucky coincidence, in our view, best practice agriculture also happens to be uh, low emission agriculture. So in the long run, the most productive form of agriculture for us uh, will be uh, the, the lower emission form of agriculture. It wasn't actually planned that way in many cases. Uh, so that gives us comfort that we don't necessarily need but would like to see carbon finance flows incentivizing that, but we can start anyway, and we've got to. Okay, thank you for that. I would just like to mention to those who are here that the, the program ASAP that Elwin is referring to, we do have a, a publication about that. And we also have an occasional paper that you are the author of called Climate Smart Smallholder Agriculture, What's Different? So I would, uh, we do have, uh, we will need to bring in Paris here in a moment for comments. But your Climate Smart Smallholder Agriculture, What's Different? Could you just tell us briefly what is different since you wrote? Mute off. Um, the, the, what I, I sort of covered that a bit before, and, and I should plug the launch of that paper tomorrow, which is at 3 p.m. Um, and uh, and it's going to be webcast, and this is, I think, what, you, what, what you've got, and it would be great to have people listening in and participating in that. It's sort of what I, what I mentioned. It's that um, people ask me, is it old wine in new bottles? I say it's 80% old wine in a new bottle, cut with sort of very strong 20% new variety of wine, new, of new grape, which really changed the taste of all of the wine. What I mean by that is if you are climate aware when we are working with any policy or any project, it really changes the context so fundamentally in many cases that while you may use many of the te familiar techniques in responding to it, you'll be using them subtly different. For example, um, I'll give you a couple of recent examples. Just the last two weeks I was working with in IFAD, where there's a program in Senegal where, we, um, where we've been working with a community that's been experiencing quite significant um, sea level rise. Uh, it's really quite striking how sea level rise is already having an impact on, on many low-lying communities. This was something I certainly hadn't appreciated a few years back. And that's leading to all kinds of salinization problems uh, for the soil, and leading to all kinds of um, problems uh, with the soil fertility. And so, you know, in the absence of climate change and sea level rise, we would have been doing something quite different in that area. We'd have been doing much more sort of traditional form of sustainable land management, looking at how to produce in more arid, um, in, in a more arid environment, because the ICET line has, has moved south 120 kilometers over, over Senegal. But now we're doing something quite different. We have to have all kinds of processes to try and stop that salinization of the soil and wash the soil, and, and it's a completely different kind of intervention. So the context is changing sufficiently that when you think about the context and plan ahead for it, you end up using tools that aren't entirely new in many cases, but you're using them quite differently. Another example, just yesterday, one of my team got back from um, Togo, where um, the, the crisis in the Sahel has, laid, has led to a, a real increase in transhumant pastoralism, where um, that's leading to all kinds of local com of conflicts between smallholder farmers and the, the pastoralists, which is leading to all kinds of maladaptation techniques. For example, um, many farmers are actually burning all the grass around their, their fields to stop the cows, to stop the, the cattle being attracted to that area, thus ruining their crops, which is having all kinds of effects on soil fertility and biodiversity. Um, so, you know, try, in trying to respond to one problem of climate change, there's sort of, there's another one being created, and the project in that area is therefore quite different.
than in the absence of it. So I guess what, I'm, what I'll be saying in more depth tomorrow is that being aware of this change risk context means using different tools in projects and policy design and development planning, which will lead to a different kind of response, which in our view will probably involve much more recourse to sustainable agriculture techniques and landscape management than were used in the past. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, a different way of measuring impacts so that we don't measure impacts in a narrow way that kind of reflects the narrow way in which government ministries, uh, the international architecture, which divides things between agriculture and environment, have traditionally been practiced. We to demonstrate value for money for the use of development finance, we've got to now demonstrate that it isn't achieving one thing at the expense of another. Mm -hmm. And that requires a much more challenging monitoring and evaluation effort yes. than we've seen in the past, where we've got to measure things like emissions. Even yeah. if that's not the driving force for our intervention, yeah. we've got to measure things like biodiversity. Yeah. Uh, extremely difficult to measure. Definitely. Um, we've got to measure local <laughs> pollution impacts. So that's yeah. the kind of thing we, we need to do. Okay, uh, I want you to hang in there. We, so now that we're on the subject of, of different uh, uh, counter impacts and looking at these, I want to briefly give, give the word back to Paris uh, here. Yes. Uh, Marion, if you're here, uh, I'd like you yes, have I'm a here. response to a response, as I understand. Uh, yes, no, it was just uh, when uh, the lady was talking about uh, our report and the fact that we didn't look at local specificity. In fact, in a short report, you never put all what you should put. But as you have seen in the summary of our report, we, we tried to be quite specific. For instance, when we gave some examples of uh, what is food insecurity, we are quite convinced that before giving solutions, you need to have a quite specific diagnosis about the source of uh, the insecurity. And that's why we explained that maybe in Vietnam, the source was the monsoon, that uh, in India, the losses of the harvest uh, because of the packaging and so on. And so we gave quite practical examples because, of course, our commission was composed of 13 members coming from very different places in the world. So it was possible to try to characterize uh, the sources of unsafety, if you want, non-safety. And of course, we have not been local because in a report of uh, 10 pages, you, you cannot be specific. But uh, I think that in every paragraph, we have talked about the local conditions. So I don't pretend that our, our report is perfect. It is not, of course. But I'm sure that we have looked at uh, food security from very specific geographical diverse point of views. Okay. That's what I wanted to add when uh, the previous speakers uh, uh, made this uh, criticism. Yeah, thank you for that. And it's very interesting to know that of the general, I think it's an accomplishment in itself that you can boil this down to seven recommendations. And one of, it may be a bit on the general, but on the other hand, it, puts every, it keeps everyone from developing all kinds of side issues. And, and it beca otherwise, the debate becomes very messy if we don't keep ourselves. Yes, that's it. To you need to be efficient to be understood, but we agree that the analysis of food insecurity needs to be uh, locally specified. Yeah. Okay. Both sides are right then. Thank you very much for that input. Elwin, are you still there? We'll go back to you then if we have... Um, yeah, still there. Okay, good. We got in the commercial break there where you're promoting your, your latest publication for tomorrow and hope that everyone heard that. Um, <clears throat> it's no problem. I had one last quick question for you and that's being, I'm from an agricultural network and I'm an agriculturalist and you made, uh, and this I just need a quick answer to this because we have to go on to our next speaker. Uh, you said the agriculture community needs to embrace climate change. 
How have we not embraced climate change? Why have we not done it? And, what, and will this report then from the Commission help us to do that? Wow, a quick answer to that one. Um, right. The, <laughs> You're on the spot. <laughs> uh, we've got to embrace climate change. I guess the first bit's simple. We've got to do it because um, whether it's uh, two degrees or the current trajectory, at least according to IEA, of six degrees based on emissions over the last few years, um, it's going to have a huge impact on our work. Second point, why have we not embraced it? is a much more difficult one. I think it's just the newness of the issue. I think it's that when we first started talking about climate change, there was all this stuff about, which to me is almost a, a, an excessively complicating factor, that it was introduced through the context of carbon markets, which are just kind of complex things and they have all kinds of acronyms. As it was the language that was used, it, the messaging was not designed to be clear, it was not designed with an agriculture audience in mind. It was designed with a UNFCCC audience in mind through the specific objective of influencing those negotiations. So it wasn't an agronomic message that particularly made sense to the wider agriculture community. Where that's evolving, although I still think we've got a bit of work to go. Um, I guess the second reason why it, it, it hasn't sort of yet been uh, sort of universally embraced is there's, there's still a bit of confusion and uh, my, my personal sense is that some of the mindsets of those working in this sector were very much formed during the era of the Green Revolution and some of the you know university syllabuses around agriculture which partly sort of um, populated the extent of the extension systems and etc., uh, you know, very much had a frame of mind of agriculture as a sort of manufacturing activity uh, with economies of scale to be reached, high inputs, uh, and this is probably an overcharacterization, but that whole mindset doesn't lend itself easily to what we're saying needs to be done for agriculture to be climate resilient. So the climate, resi the climate smart agriculture message doesn't sit that comfortably with what was the previous kind of paradigm around agriculture. So it wasn't easily accommodated. What can we do to, to make it uh, have sort of wider understanding? Sort of what we're doing, um, I think we need to be careful about two specific labels, whether we call it climate smart agriculture or something else. Uh, we need a much better communication effort. We need that effort to be focused, in my view, much more on the sort of core agriculture community than, uh, than perhaps in the past where most of our efforts were around influencing the UNFCCC process, although we've still got to do both. So a lot of communications, a lot of advocacy work, and a lot of sensitization with developing country partners that we need to talk about this, not because we're insisting they've got to reduce their emissions footprint, because smallholders are not the driver of the major share of agriculture emissions, but because it's a, this is a sort of, emissions are a byproduct and we're really talking about poverty reduction and adapting to this pretty dreadful thing that is, is, is happening. Okay, that, for that, with those optimistic words, uh, thank you very much for your input and we need to move on.